Right, hello, everybody. This is uh, Dr. Anthony Chafee, and with me is a, is a very special guest. Someone I'm very excited to talk to is Dr. Uh, Peter Bellerstedt. He's a PhD in forage agronomy. Um, he has been doing quite a lot of work uh, for years and years and years, obviously, in, in that field with uh, regenerative um, livestock and farming. And he has been so good at, at putting out videos and, and uh, resources into the science behind uh, livestock management and and farming and regenerative farming. Um, Peter, thank you so much for for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Great. Um, so so for people that don't know of your work, can you just uh, give us a brief introduction about yourself and and what you do and and the sort of work you do? Well, I'm I'm trained as a forage agronomist, so specializing in those sciences to do with soil and crop production in. Uh, agriculture. Uh, forages are those plants that are eaten by livestock, um, either directly in pasture or conserved as hay or cut and carried to animals. Um, I also have a minor in ruminant nutrition. So I was trained in animal nutrition. Mm -hmm. And I functioned in that space, plus or minus since 1986, when I graduated with my doctorate. So it's been a little while, yeah. <laughs> um, but then starting and I currently work for a seed company, so I'm still in the forage uh, world. I serve on national and international uh, groups that are working in that space. Um, but starting in 2007, I had my own personal health journey where, as I put it, I realized I was a 51 year old balding obese prediabetic. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so thanks to books and uh, writers that my wife introduced me to and that then I met over the years, you know, I'm just balding today. Um, <laughs> it's not a miracle. Um, but along the way, in about 2010, I started attending some in-person events where I got to meet people like Gary Taubes and mm. Steve Finney and Eric Westman. And yes, I know I'm name dropping. Mm. Um, but so I got to meet all these wonderful people. There's lots more. Um, but amazingly enough, I was the only forage agronomist there. It was remarkable. <laughs> so, uh, um, so I quickly realized that I was learning really valuable information from them that my forage agronomy, ruminant nutrition tribes mm -hmm. ought to know about. Um, and at the same time, I was convinced that I knew people and information about forage agronomy and ruminant nutrition that this metabolic community should learn about. And yeah. so I've been trying to do that plus or minus for, well, since 2010. Oh, great. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's the thing, you know, obviously I, I talk about how, you know, the benefits of a meat-based diet or even a meat exclusive diet and getting away from different sorts of, uh, you know, foods that contain different toxins or, you know, even carbohydrates and sugar that derail our metabol uh, metabolism, get, get put, put us in a hyperinsulinemic state and, and, and uh, perpetuate various diseases. Um, but a lot of people then say, okay, well, that's all well and good, but you know, what about the environment and are cows destroying the world and, and all these sorts of things? Um, you know, and, uh, and, and so it's been, you know, obviously you, you do a lot of work in this uh, field. So one of the, one of the things that I get asked all the time is well, what about the sustainability that's all well and good for you to eat meat but you know can we actually do this on a large scale can a lot you know, billions of people around the world or is that a sustainable model to to eat a bunch of meat well can we afford not to mm. why do we assume that you know a plant based which by the way is the current diet of humanity yeah, the majority of humanity's calories end up coming from plant sources. Well, what are those? Sugar, <laughs> starch. Any yeah. problem with that? Um, the majority for humanity, the majority of humanity's protein is supplied by plants. Yeah. And I've spent a bit of time trying to just say plant source protein and animal source protein are not equivalent. 
so and yet they're treated as if they are by a lot of people engaged in this sustainability space. So, you know, animal source food is far superior in terms of nutrition than plant source food. It doesn't mean that people can't eat plant source foods. You know, some people can, many people can, some people can't. And it's good that they figure that out because as you're aware, there's a number of conditions that some people have that when they eliminate some or all plant source foods, their health improves dramatically. Well, okay, people should know that. So um, I make the point that we currently have something like 800 million human beings who are calorically undernourished. It's starvation. It's the stuff of that should, I mean, we should be well beyond that. It's mostly got to do with political unrest, mm -hmm. conflict, you know, market issues, those things we can and should sort out. But we've got at the same time 2.2 billion people in the world who are overweight or obese. Mm -hmm. Well, that's every bit as much malnutrition, I'm convinced, as the 800 million that don't get enough calories. So, you know, we've gone through this progress, progression, where we were working to eliminate caloric insufficiency for humanity. Yeah. So if, you're, if you're starving, you have one problem. <laughs> um, and you'll do anything it takes to alleviate that problem. But we've progressed to a point where we need to be concerned about the quality of our diet. Mm -hmm. And and unfortunately, there's some conventional wisdom in the way of us understanding that. So that's part of the conversation as well, that at, at, given that, given that we have somewhere between 20 and 25 percent of children globally under the age of five who are stunted, yeah. which is not only their stature, but it's also cognitive development, which is a lifelong decrement. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time that we've got a third of women globally, yesterday, as we're recording this, yesterday was the International Day, Women's Day, mm -hmm. forgive me for not getting the title right, but a third of women globally are anemic. Right. And all of that is due to a lack of animal source food. Mm -hmm. Now, people will say, well, but if they could get the essential nutrition that they need to avoid, yeah, where are you going to get it from? Oh, animal source food. Yeah. Right? There, there's like layers of narrative in place here where people will talk about high quality, nutrient dense. You got to pick those things apart. And at the bottom, what it means is animal source food. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, except for those people who define high uh, nutrient dense as being low fat. Yeah, because there are, there are people who don't consider fat from animal. You know, they don't consider that a nutrient. Yeah. 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 Which, which of course, it very much is. You know? <laughs> really, really. So yeah. so I've, I'm preparing a presentation that I need to record this week, and I grabbed a graphic out of the uh, Dietary Guidelines for Americans 20 to 25. And by their definition, vegetable oil is nutrient dense. Butter is yeah. not. Okay. <laughs> so that, that unsweetened shredded wheat cereal is nutrient dense but sweetened isn't yeah that that soda is not nutrient dense but sparkling water is how, how many nutrients are in sparkling water exactly? i'm not exactly sure you know i'm just an agronomist you know some yeah. of these things are obviously <laughs> way above me here um so yeah um yeah you were talking about um obviously the protein availability 
in plant-based uh, sources versus uh, meat-based sources. And one of, one of the things I, I've heard you speak about is the difference between, you know, crude protein and, you know, the non-protein you know, nitrogen that's found in, in plants, but, and, and how this is actually passed off as, as protein on the label and so forth. Can you, can you tell us a bit about, you know, crude protein, actual available protein? Sure. So crude protein is a estimate of food or feed quality um, in animal science and animal nutrition. We've used it for many, many years. Um, mostly now we use it in ruminant animal nutrition, um, not so much in swine, which is a monogastric, more like humans. It's <laughs> what we do to determine crude protein is we determine the percent nitrogen in a sample of feed or food we multiply that one number by 6.25 and that equals crude protein. Now that's based on the assumption that all the nitrogen that was in that sample was in protein and all that protein was 16% nitrogen. Mm -hmm. So it's relatively easy to do. It's relatively inexpensive and we've been doing it for over almost a century and a half. Mm -hmm. uh, so we got lots of data in some parts of the world. We've got lots of data, not so much in others. Um, but the problem is then that value is put on labels or in food tables. They drop that crude off the front of it and they call it protein. Right. And, and then people track their macros think, thinking that that's some meaningful value when in fact it's crude protein. Mm -hmm. So what's the problem? The problem is that we as monogastrics, that's not a meaningful measure of food quality for us. We need essential amino acids in the proper amount and they must be absorbable by us from our gut when we eat them. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, so remember there was a thing about melanine a little while ago? Mm. Um, well, melanine happens to be a nitrogen rich compound. Um, so some people in China apparently um, were adding it to diluted milk to raise the protein level up. The only problem is it's toxic. Okay, great. And then, then some of it actually got to the U.S. in pet food. Right. Again, to raise the protein level. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the what, the protein represented by crude protein contains true protein, but it also contains what we call non-protein nitrogen. Right. Right. So that's where the melanin comes in. It's a non-protein nitrogen source <clears throat> that we then multiply by 6.25. In plants, it could be nitrate mm -hmm. or any other nitrogenous non-protein material that's going to go into the estimate of what its protein content is. So, so that's one layer of this. The other, and, and by the way, the, the swine industry has known this for about half a century now okay. and has been balancing rations on an amino acid basis. Okay. And for almost 10 years, that's been the recommendation of FAO that they develop that kind of a system for human nutrition. Right. Uh, um, but it, it's, it's not merely the presence because some of the amino acids, specifically lysine, actually its digestibility can be influenced by processing. Mm. So we take something like cereal, which is low in lysine, and we make it into something brown and or crispy. Mm hmm and we take that lysine, we bind it irreversibly to carbohydrate, and it's then not available to us. Yeah. So now you, you, it's not just whether it's present or not, it's whether we can absorb it or not. And, and so if we have this pool of essential amino acids that we're absorbing, we're only gonna be able to utilize up to the level of that limiting amino acid, mm -hmm. then we're going to oxidize the rest of them 
re so it's it's far more complicated than most people appreciate and i appreciate that i don't always communicate it succinctly and clearly but what it you know take it back a step and it's just easier if you eat animal source food in your diet yeah and you don't have to worry about this yeah but you only have to worry about this if you're creating these diets that are well beyond the sort of species appropriate you know kind of human experience diet yeah and so yeah and, that, and that's the thing so you know, we, we obviously have labels and it says, you know, this is how much protein this is, but you know, from, from what you're saying, you know, quite clearly is that, you know, that number does not actually represent usable protein, uh, by the, you know, the, the person who's eating it. So, you know, the, you know, 30 grams of protein from, you know, a steak or, you know, some sort of meat, you know, animal meat product is, is likely going to have about 30 grams of absorbable protein, whereas in plant protein, it, it may or may not be absorbable. It may be, you know, lysine bound to carbohydrates and so forth. So that's blocked out, have other sorts of reasons why uh, it's difficult to extract the protein from it, or it may not even be protein at all. It may just be nitrogen uh, that we're just calling protein because it's easier than actually doing a proper calculation. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, now it's, it's possible that for example, you can, you can combine, but you need information <laughs> and, and the combination works best when you include animal source food with your plant source food. Mm -hmm. Now I've spoken with researchers well-established in the field who tell me that an eight year old boy, for example, physically could not consume enough rice and lentils to mm. meet his lysine requirements just a physical limitation yeah and then what else are they getting with rice and lentils right yeah so so all of that becomes part of the conversation but this is just one of those realities that as i said hasn't been well understood or acknowledged in the conversation yeah yeah about and it, sustainability it, it... Yeah, absolutely. You know, because you know, like you, like you, you said, um, you know, if you're, if you're not getting his proper you know, protein and so forth, you're not gonna be able to develop properly. You're not going to be able to maintain a healthy body and, and you're going to be bringing on in a lot of other sort of, you know, toxic elements that are in, you know, lentils, beans, rice, and so forth that are going to detract from your health as well. So it's not going to be as healthy. You're not going to be able to extract the same nutrition and it's going to come up with a, another bag of problems as well. Um, if you, if you're able to, um, sort of tell us, you know, you, you talk about in some of your talks, you might want like a, you know, ruminant revolution, you know, want to get me you a know, ruminant, you know, livestock, um, uh, you know, much more of a part of our, our daily lives, certainly our, our, uh, diet. Um, what is it that, that ruminants do for the environment that that's so beneficial? How does this help, you know, soil health and, and, and actually help the environment and help, you know, the, the the plants as well as the animals on the, on the world? Well, ultimately ruminants, because of the microorganisms that they foster within their pre-gastric digestive system, their rumen, they're a key link in the energy flow throughout the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. So everything is driven by photosynthesis, the conversion of CO2, and water with sunlight into carbohydrate and then producing oxygen as a byproduct. Well, the only organisms in the biosphere, the entire earth that can liberate the glucose that's bound up in cellulose are these microorganisms. So the, the ruminant is this key link and that anim those animals can utilize a high fiber, poor protein quality, low fat feed resource and create from it highest quality for our nutrition, protein, fat, and bioavailable minerals and essential vitamins. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's pretty key. Then, because of our agricultural systems, they're capable of using a lot of our 
crop residue, the byproducts from processing. So this this fee food that's being produced for us produces feed for animals, no competition. Mm -hmm. The ruminants are able to use what's a waste product and create again. So one of my jokes is that you can't get milk from almond, but you can get it from almond hulls via oh, yeah. dairy cattle because in in California, a great deal of feed going to those dairy animals is is almond hulls. Yeah. Okay. So um, there are other byproducts, but that's just one and it's my poor attempt at humor. <laughs> so that's that's another key point. Uh, number three is the vast majority of the Earth's surface cannot produce crops for direct human utilization. So this is another thing that people get confused. They confuse agricultural land with arable land, that is land that we can till. Mm -hmm. So all arable land is agricultural land, mm -hmm. but not all agricultural land is arable. So one example that I've heard is if you imagine one thirty second of an apple, mm -hmm. that's the arable land surface of the world. Yeah. And then peel the peel off that. And that's what all that agricultural system depends on right mm -hmm. that that surface that soil resource and so that gets us to the next bit uh complete the last one and that is that while that land that's not agricultural land that's not suitable for cultivation is suitable for producing forages native rangelands managed or introduced species or what have you um, and that can be converted into livestock products for our consumption. Um, in a, taking it then the next step, whenever we till soil, we're going to see a reduction in organic matter content and soil structure. Mm -hmm. That's inevitable. It's not to say we should never till but those are consequences of doing it. And so what we're finding is we can now bring these ruminant animals into our cropping systems and we can improve soil quality. We can get more food produced on the same land for the same or lower inputs, plus get benefits to soil health over time. So these systems are now being demonstrated. They've been researched for many years. Um, a lot of what now is seemingly new to a lot of people has been researched by people who trained me and who trained the people who trained me. You know, it's sort of like people coming newly into the therapeutic carbohydrate reduction space mm -hmm. without knowing about Pennington, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a history to this. And I'm very glad that people are finding out about it because obviously I'm excited and I think it's the most important thing in the world. But we should acknowledge some of the history that, that came along. And so that's also part of my hope is that as I introduce the human metabolic tribe to the forage and ruminant animal agriculture tribe, we can get to appreciate a lot of this a lot more. Um, you know, unfortunately, there's still like a billion people in the world that are dependent on burning biofuel right. to cook on. A lot of that's dung. That's not a good thing, but it is an essential resource at this time. Mm -hmm. Just just like over half of the fertilizer that's used to produce human edible crops in the world mm -hmm. is coming from livestock. Yeah, Most of that's coming from ruminants. Um, you know, a, a large number of some of the most vulnerable people in the world are pastoralists. Mm -hmm. So they're raising livestock in sort of traditional ways and people entertain notions of getting rid of it. And my question is what replaces it? 
yeah. you know, like half the world's farmers still depend on draft animals for their tractors. Jesus, I did not know that. No. So, so you know, the forty-five percent of humanity consumes less electrical power per year than a large North American refrigerator. Okay, <laughs> that's like a thousand kilowatt hours. Is yeah. the for is forty five percent of humanity gets less than that. The yeah. per, the population of India with no reliable access to electricity is larger mm. than the entire population of the United States. Right. Yeah. And how much bigger is the U.S. than Australia? Yeah. So you know, basically, forty five percent of humanity would like to go from where people living in Chicago in nineteen hundred were. <laughs> to yeah. somewhere closer to today. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and and so let's feed all this into the conversation about sustainability. Yeah, yeah, so that's, that's the thing that, um, you know, a lot of people don't don't realize, you know, they think that, or they, they get told and then they repeat that, you know, livestock, you know, eat a bunch of, uh, of the crops that we grow. And that if we, if we only just took those crops and gave those to people, we, we would end world hunger. We wouldn't have any of these problems. Um, but you know that ignores the fact that the majority of this stuff is inedible by humans. It's hay and 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 you know the chaff and cobs and things like that that, that are waste products, and that you know the waste from the cows then turn into fertilizer, and that you know animals going through an ecosystem and eating down you know the, the different sorts of you know grasses or um, you know shrubberies and so forth, they they actually benefit the land. More than they take away because they're they're recycling these nutrients and recycling the the nutrients in the soil and uh, and actually benefiting the land uh, as opposed to detracting from it. Um, so that that's that's one of the things you know that uh, not everybody understands is you know when you, when you do monocropping and you're just you're just you know tilling a whole big field and you're and you're just growing one crop. Um, there are a couple, there are a few things that, you know, I know you, you spoke about that this, this can damage the, the land. This, we can you know, run, you know, lose topsoil and so forth. Um, and uh, this, this can you know, impact the environment in, in many other ways. Is that something you can uh, sort of enlighten us about? Well, yes. So if the soil loses structure, um, then water and air is less able to infiltrate into it. Um, now, not all soils inherently have the same structure, the same properties. So, you know, one size doesn't fit all. But the more organic matter that a soil has, the more water it can hold mm -hmm. and the more nutrients it can hold. And that means that crops grown on that soil are less susceptible to drought. It means that um, if, if that soil in an area is more open to infiltration of water, we have less runoff. Mm -hmm. And so the watershed is healthier. Um, and if we have a perennial community of plants on top of that soil, holding it together and protecting it, it's less susceptible to erosion, either by wind or water. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we've gone through periods of great erosion in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are quite famous, but it's still going on. Um, I, I was in one part of the country where I'm told that since the 60s, they've lost 18 inches of topsoil wow. on these incredibly, and nobody knows they're doing this. Nobody intends to do this. This stuff happens. There's an explanation for all of it, but we've got to do better. That's the mm -hmm. point. And, you know, now that we're learning more and people are adopting these practices. Mm -hmm. um, so those are some of the things that you could you know, the, one of the realities is if you dig up sod, remove all the sod, if you've ever done it, you know, that's no mean thing, but get rid of all the sod mm -hmm. so that there's no more plants there. And then you water that you're going to get plants. <laughs> mm -hmm. There's a lot of seed there in the soil already. 
And it's kind of like nature's band-aid. Nature doesn't want, you know, not that anthropomorphize nature, but because of the seed bank that's in the soil, when that soil is exposed and then the conditions favor germination, you're going to get a lot of weeds. Well, we have to, we have to suppress the existing vegetation to produce the crops that we want. Mm. And you can do that in a number of ways, but at the end of the day, that's what you're going to do. So what's happened in North America, in you know the eastern part of what we think of as the plains, most of that now has been converted mm -hmm. from a tall grass prairie to commodity crops. Yeah. And farming's gone through a number of changes over the years. And again, there's explanations for that. But the idea that there's a lot more of that kind of land that's available to produce the commodity crops that people think they can feed to people instead of livestock products. Mm -hmm. So back to your point about feed versus food, if you look at the entire domestic livestock herd, I think the figure is something like 14% of the feed mm -hmm. that goes into feeding all the domesticated livestock is potentially human edible. Right. If you just look at ruminants, it's about not 4%. Okay. And, and a quarter of that is estimated to be feed grains that were not um, suitable for human consumption. Okay. And then we can argue about whether people should be consuming them just because you can, doesn't mean you should. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're looking at in terms of this feed to food thing. I've also seen figures that say that two thirds of the cereal crops, what was it? Actually, actually all you could take all the cereal that's fed to ruminants. I believe this is the case. That's only 10% of okay. our cereal crop production. Yeah. Well, so one of the scandals today is that cereals is a larger source of protein, in quotes, in humanity's diet than all animal source foods combined. Right. And wheat is the single largest source of protein. Yeah. In humanity's diet. And so it's like, that's where we already are. And that's the problem. Yeah. Well, that, yeah. Yeah. That's the thing too, is that, you know, what people don't realize is, is, um, you know, 80% of the, of the protein available or, or protein in wheat is gluten and gluten is not available, uh, to us for, uh, for, for use as protein. So 80% of that protein is absolutely unusable. Uh, by humans and it also causes you know leaky gut it binds to you know, you know causes these uh, you know breaks in your in your gut lining and and uh, and and you know allows lectins and other sorts of nonsense and bacteria and to get in the system 80 percent of the phosphorus that's contained in those cereals mm -hmm. is not available to us right yeah and and so now let's think about okay we've got this we people want to talk about circular systems but the reality is we're heading toward 2050 when I think it is that 75% or more of humanity will be living in urban areas. Mm -hmm. So we're pumping nutrients from where the food is produced to where the food is going to be consumed. And then the system is broken in terms of how that gets back to the land. Yeah. So one could say or suggest wouldn't it be better if the if if the foods that those nutrients are being exported in were of the most utilizable form so that the highest percentage of what's getting exported gets absorbed mm -hmm. well that doesn't enter into the conversation too much either yeah. and we haven't even gotten yet to the the cost the impact of chronic disease yeah yeah which is which also has a huge social economic and environmental impact
Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, so I mean, from everything you're saying, I mean, this doesn't uh, this doesn't suggest that uh, you know livestock and so forth reduces the f- food supply in, in any in any reasonable way whatsoever. And, and from what it sounds like you're saying, that that given these you know some edible sorts of you know grains and so forth, but the majority of inedible. Um, what we're getting back from livestock is, is far more than we're actually putting in. Yeah, absolutely. This, the I forgot to mention it. Thank you for the prompt. Um, this role of upcycling mm-hmm. nutritional quality. So you know when when you can't use it at all, it's kind of hard to estimate the scale because like dividing by zero is a problem. I mean we we. we far increase the value of the feeds that we're feeding into ruminants. Mm -hmm. And so even that those, you know, if if it's unutilizable by us, then okay, it's infinite. If it's utilizable by us, it's still a significant increase. Yeah. So, you know, these ruminant animals and and there's lots of them around the world and the systems look different depending on where you are but they're absolutely essential to to sustainable food systems Mm -hmm. like you cannot be serious and support sustainable food systems if you're against animal agriculture in general and ruminant animal agriculture in particular Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, I think I remember hearing you say at one point that it was more, uh, you got more and better uh, nutrition from uh, growing a field of alfalfa and feeding that to a dairy cow than you would for growing a, a crop of wheat in that same area. Um, is that what you're talking about with that, this upcycling and just getting more out of it? Exactly. Of course, except for alfalfa sprouts, <laughs> yeah. we can't really utilize alfalfa directly. Mm-hmm. Now, people again and again and again look at extracting protein from alfalfa to feed to human beings and i keep saying isn't that what the cow is for yeah Um, (laughs) but okay i get it um but yes absolutely upcycling is a key part of all those advantages um and and we haven't yet talked about the byproducts that come from livestock. Mm-hmm. We did talk about fertilizer, mm-hmm. and bone meal is one of those fertilizers. Meat and blood meal is another fertilizer that goes back mm-hmm. in. Leather, obviously, pharmaceuticals, rendering byproducts. All of those are key. Mm-hmm. Um, so. And it's interesting because while that industry is key to the meat industry, the environmental impact is all put onto the meat. Yeah. Not any portion of it. And it's hard to do that kind of stuff. But even there, if you know, we start talking about greenhouse gas emissions, water use, we've talked about land use, but we haven't the the conversation has been so oversimplified and so misrepresented that I can stand here today and say, as it is today, beef is almost certainly net zero. Now they're working to demonstrate it. And, but, but the way to do that, so there was a paper came out last spring. It's so it's almost a year old now back to this, crude protein, digestible protein, utilizable protein. Mm -hmm. And utilizable protein in this paper was defined by the amount of available lysine, Mm -hmm. right? If you're looking in a diet, Um, again, because if you don't have enough lysine, you're not gonna be able to utilize the rest of the digestible protein. So it's sort of like the second choke point in, in that example. Um, if you start and you look at crude protein and they looked at diet information for like 103 countries or territories, what they basically 
said is, okay, here's your target intake. Oh yeah, that would be something else we could talk about. The recommended daily allowance of 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight is a minimum. Mm -hmm. People treat it as if it's a target. Okay, mm -hmm. so, so even at that low target, I'm sorry, minimum, they say, okay, well, based on crude protein, look, this is, it looks like all these low and middle income countries are meeting protein. And so then you have people saying, well, protein isn't a nutrient of concern globally. Mm -hmm. Okay. But if you then tease it apart and say, how much of that is digestible? Well, now you got about half of those are below that low level. And then if you look at the amount of lysine, so the utilizable protein, you end up with almost none of those 103 countries or territories are meeting mm -hmm. what they, and, and then that's before we ever talk about, well, should that target be higher? Yeah. Right. Which we have good evidence for. So we, we have people in this conversation space saying protein is not a nutrient of concern when it manifestly is. Mm -hmm. The end result of them going through that exercise and looking at the actual utilizable protein was it cut the emissions intensity by a factor of 100 for dairy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it then brings dairy below the emissions intensity for utilizable protein for soy beverage. Mm. So, so that adjustment, only looking at protein, brings those foodstuffs to be comparable. Mm -hmm. So anything we're going to do to produce food is going to have an environmental impact. Let's be serious about this. Yeah. But when we evaluate them properly, okay, but now wait, but wait, there's more mm -hmm. because it's not only protein as important as that is that we're getting from animal source foods. And so there's been other work looking at the environmental, the emissions intensity to produce the shortfall micronutrients and all of the animal source foods are at the low end of emissions intensity compared to other foodstuffs, the plant sources, a function of their nutritional makeup. Mm -hmm. Oh, and the last thing which I love is even in the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change latest mm -hmm. report in August, they stated that the metric that they've been using to estimate warming potential mm -hmm. from enteric methane, that is the methane that comes out of the cow's rumens via burps, mm -hmm. they've been overestimating that impact by a factor of three to four. Oh, is that all? That's all. Yeah. And, and underestimating the impact of methane from hydrocarbons. Gee, I, yeah, okay. I wonder, I wonder how that happened. Yeah, well, so, so now that we've, so, but before I was saying that animal source foods, when we look at the entire group of nutrients that we get from them are comparable or mm -hmm. already, but we yeah. need to now divide that by a factor of three at least. Yeah. So it's now much less. Oh, yeah. and by the way, they haven't really been doing a good job of looking at the carbon that's sequestered in the soils mm -hmm. under these grasslands. Mm -hmm. So already, when you look at the budgets in the United States put out by EPA, it says, what is the, you know, carbon, the emissions budget sources and sinks, mm -hmm. agriculture and forestry, you know, the, the land use, the pause, we're already net negative. Yeah. Today. Yeah. yeah. Could do better, could do better. Yeah. That's not the issue. Yeah. Now, I can't help myself 
there was a paper that estimated the emissions, greenhouse gas emissions from U.S. healthcare at 10% mm -hmm. of total U.S. Mm -hmm. All of animal agriculture is four. Right. Beef alone is two. Yeah. Okay. What are we talking about here? Yeah. I mean, it, it, so, so anything that could reduce healthcare need mm -hmm. in the United States, what might that be? Yeah. Oh, okay. We'll come back <laughs> yeah. to that perhaps. <laughs> yeah. Proper nutrition. Could, so again, there are many pieces to this and, yeah. and people have, there's one wonderful graphic I just got from someone that, you know, imagine a circle where you've got 24 or so different items arranged around the circumference of that circle. Mm -hmm. And you've got some people that are just focusing in only on greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah. As one of those. Meanwhile, you've got others who are saying, wait a minute, these other, all of them are important to sustainable issues. Mm -hmm. But too many people have had myopia and just looking at that one. And if you yeah. just look at that one, you're going to perturb some of those others in ways you don't understand, comprehend, aren't even looking at. So again, there is a paper, a series of estimates that said that if, if all of, I should get this one because I'm going to get it wrong. I know mm -hmm. it. Um, it's so the average American with type two diabetes uses pharmaceuticals equal to two metric tons of CO2 equivalent per year. Okay. Okay, so yeah. what's that? Um, well, let's just let's just wildly speculate here that perhaps maybe someday in the future there's a way for the average type two diabetic to reduce or eliminate. Oh my goodness, let's really get crazy. Their medication use. Mm -hmm. You know, like hypothetically, maybe type two diabetes is not incurable and progressive. Mm -hmm. Okay sarcasm turned wildly. off yeah yeah wildly so that amount if you then looked at all of the type 2 diabetics today that's something like a potential reduction of 50 million metric tons of co2 right okay i still don't know what that means mm -hmm. that's equivalent to more than 10.8 million passenger car years yeah off the road yeah yeah okay that's like four percent of the registered passenger vehicles in the united states mm -hmm. or put it another way that's more than 4.7 times the cumulative sales mm -hmm. of all the plug-in electrical cars to date as of last december yeah but this is every year right Okay, so so put another way, if the average type two, if the average adult type two diabetic in America could eliminate their medication use, they reduce their carbon footprint 29% more mm -hmm. than if they went from a high meat to a vegan diet. Yeah. Now, p can people stay on a vegan diet? I don't no, think so. no, very rarely do people maintain that. I mean, it just seems to be the evidence. Um, can people stay on a? I think so. Uh, yeah. So, so again, I understand that I'm jumping around and you know speculating wildly here, but we're we're dealing with a very complex system. Um, mm -hmm. The the quote that I came across was something like. Um, ecosystems are not only more complex than we think they're more complex than we can think yeah yeah i i think that's a, that's a good way of putting it you know i mean this, is, this yet, is the entire world you know well and and yet we have people making very confident assertions about yeah. if you'd only do this then that and well but wait there's there's several points along this circle that we should and human health is one of them 
Yeah. And, and by my experience, we haven't given that sufficient credit yet. And that's one of my missions is to get us talking more so that these conversations about sustainability can include because when sustainable healthcare comes up, it comes with the implicit assumption, sometimes explicit, that if people would only eat more fiber and mm -hmm. more whole grains and less meat, that they'd mm -hmm. be healthier. Yeah, which is, uh, you know, painfully wrong. You know. Well, I'd like to see their data. Yeah. <laughs> at least. Yeah. And, and I'm not convinced they have data. I'm convinced that they have you know, nutritional epidemiology and model projections. Yeah. And, and supposition and fraud. You know, I mean, a lot of this is, is, is based on the fact that, you know, they, you know, the USDA you know, said in 1977 that cholesterol causes heart disease, saturated fat increases cholesterol. Therefore, meat is bad. Therefore, meat, red meat and eggs are really bad. And if something doesn't have fat and cholesterol, Therefore, it's good for you, which is which is where the whole idea of eating a whole bunch of uh, you know grains and even sugar, uh, fruits and vegetables came from, and that's that's all the, the proof and evidence that that they ever need. Uh, even well, and, and environmentalism was also part of that all the way back there. Right. Uh, I mean, diet for a small planet yeah. is cited in the dietary goals. Oh, great! Which was the product of that Senate subcommittee. Mm -hmm. So they reproduced tables, they cited in the reference this book, uh, which, by the way, advocates this idea that you can combine, you know, complementary proteins and make complete protein. And it's just not that easy. Mm -hmm. um, and so then that became the dietary guidelines. I mean, that's so it goes all the way back to that point. Mm -hmm. and, and we need to acknowledge that. It wasn't merely the human health, although obviously that was important coming on the heels of watching a U.S. president have a heart attack, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Yeah. And then <clears throat> so this sort of ties into you know, the fact that everyone everyone says that you know, if we are eating more uh, animals and we have livestock, this is just killing the environment. This is causing global warming and, and all these sorts of things. But obviously, you know, as you just pointed out, that, that that's not the case. You know, everyone, everyone worries about CO2, but this has a much lower CO2 footprint uh, than, than, you know, crop production. And if we're going to be switching to a plant-based diet anyway, we're replacing meat with more crops. We have to grow more crops and have bigger carbon footprint. You know, I maintain that CO2 is um, actually a, a good resource. This is, is what plants breathe and it actually can, can benefit as well. Um, but you know, if you, if that is a metric that, that is of concern, it's not, it's not as cut and dry as they've been saying, what about the, the, the water impact? This is something that everyone says, you know, that, that, you know, that, that cows and livestock just take up so much water and so much, you know, uh, resources in that regard that, and that's really hurting the environment and, and hurting everyone else and, and taking away from our water supply. What would you say about that? A couple things. One is animals perform within the water cycle just like humans do. So they don't destroy water. Right? Yeah. Um, a lot of the estimates are based on looking at how much water falls on a hectare of land. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then assuming, okay, so you can only produce one calf per hectare. So how much meat do you get from that calf? Therefore, all that water went into that calf. Right. Yeah. And, and so obviously that's not accurate. It's happened. It gets cited. There's a difference in water that comes out of a stream, um, you know, falls on the ground versus water that you have to pump out of the ground from aquifers, all of that. There's been some really good work that looks across the United States and it's going to look different. The water use in New England is going to look a lot different than the water use in Arizona. Yeah. Um, so, but again, this is all something occurring within a natural system. Mm -hmm. And if we can demonstrate, as I think we have, that it's better for the hydrologic function of an ecosystem to have natural or, or grasslands, perennial grasslands, which require grazing, mm -hmm. you know, something that's occurred in, I know, Australia frequently, but in the US, if you don't graze grasslands, they will burn. 
Yeah. And yeah. most of these ecosystems evolved under fire and grazing. Mm -hmm. And so if we take the grazing away, we get the fire. And if we've built up a lot of fuel, then they're hotter, mm -hmm. more destructive, harder to control versus those that might occur in a better managed. And again, this is not a simple thing. You can't just blanket apply it, but it's just clear that if we don't utilize these grasslands with grazing animals, then we suffer consequences. So the water um, estimates are frequently bloated, sorry. Mm -hmm. The greenhouse gas emissions are frequently inflated. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, and at the end of the day, we're still going to have to eat something. Yeah. And so most of wh where is that going to come from? Who's going to produce that where? And then we can talk about trade offs. But again, we, we too much, certainly in the United States, we've devolved into this us and them kind of approach to things. And it's just not helpful. And I'm getting tired of it, although I haven't fully weaned myself from it. Um, there is no agriculture without animal agriculture. Yeah. Right. So there is no, you know, animal, there is no plant agriculture without animal agriculture. Yeah. And, and our animal agriculture systems that we have today, certainly in the U.S., they're also present in Australia, <clears throat> means that we're going to be utilizing byproducts from crop agriculture. Mm -hmm. So, and, and then in parts of certainly in the Southern Great Plains, even producing winter wheat, for example, mm -hmm. we can graze that during the winter, take the animals off before the seed head starts elongating up through the tiller and still get a grain crop. So now we're getting both products off the same bit of land. Right. And that's that's before we ever start thinking of silvo pastoral cropping systems yeah. where maybe, you know, we're going to grow trees in wide spaced rows and we'll grow soybeans in between. And then when the soybeans are harvested, we'll plant a forage crop as a short rotation and then graze animals on that until it's time to grow soybeans again. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I find it interesting is what drives soybean production is not for animals. It's for soybean oil. Yeah, yeah. So if you want to like impact global soybean production, which is what's driving deforestation in mm -hmm. certain parts of the world, then get people to stop using soybean oil. Yeah. Well, you know, but then, you know, that that resource would have to come from somewhere else that's currently, you know, the soybean meal that's being used in a variety of other products. So it, it again, it's it's a complicated system that we benefit from. And yeah. we have the opportunity individually to choose what to eat. Now, that doesn't exist for a large part of humanity, right? Yeah. Um, I once heard I, I, I think I got this, the source secondhand from um, uh, Dr. Georgia Ede, but something like 95% of the world's vegetarians would like to not be. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it's not a choice. It's an, it's, it, it's an essential, yeah. you know, function of their circumstance. Yeah. And that gets us back to, you know, all of those, what, what, what is it? 56%. I think that's it. Again, I'm looking at a slide set that I'm about to deliver, so I better get this. Um, 59% of children 6 to 23 months globally are not fed eggs, dairy, fish, or meat. Wow. And yet those foods are accepted as the ideal food for children in that age group. Yeah. And 59% of children globally are not getting it. Jesus. Yeah. So, and, and, and then 
we as a species worldwide population is growing older mm -hmm. such that by 20 i think it's 2100 something like that there won't be any more children 15 years and younger than there are today mm -hmm. but that 2 billion or whatever more human beings are going to be people like myself in their 60s, 70s, 80s, maybe even 90s. We know that older human beings require a higher plane of nutrition yeah. than perhaps a 20 or 30 year old man does. Mm -hmm. I won't include women because of childbearing and everything else. So it, it, we're, we're, we, have had these one size fits all recommendations for far too long. Yeah. And, um, you know, just to, to sort of touch on, on some of that, <clears throat> you know, are talking about, uh, you know, the world, your worldwide malnutrition and, um, and state of chronic disease, um, that you can have undernourishment and, and your people can be undernourished and not getting proper, uh, nutrition, while still being in a, in a caloric, uh, you know, eucaloric state or even a caloric surplus. Um, and that's, uh, it sounds like, you know, 50, what was it? 59% of kids are probably in that state. They're not getting proper nutrition. They may be getting enough calories, but they're not getting appropriate nutrition for proper development. Right. Um, the phrase that I've learned is you, you can be undernourished, but overfed. Right. Yeah. And, and that obesity, unfortunately, I, I've listened to people who've done the work where they go into a community and they just supplement whatever they're eating, like, like they design a program to introduce poultry for mm -hmm. egg production. And, and they teach people how to do this and they provide the chickens and they look at the house, you know, what, it, and they can see scholastic performance differences in mm -hmm. the children years later, right? They, right. You know, they, they make sure that this gets to, one of the things they have to make sure is that the woman has permission from the how, the man. It's just mm -hmm. the function of those cultures and don't, you know, it's like, that's just the way it is. You have to convince the man not to sell every egg and that right. some of those should go to their own children before they start right so so these are complicated things um it's not it's not as simple as me you know going over to my bookshelf and saying here's the forages 101 book and here's the animal nutrition and here good you've got it all sorted all done good next no yeah. it, it, we, we've got to uh find you know uh, ways for um, this to be deployable. I'm, I'm looking right now, um, percent of 30 year old people who would die before their 70th birthday from any of cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, or chronic respiratory disease. Okay, so that's, <clears throat> there's a metric about that. Uh, and there's a whole lot of the world right now, including most of Africa, that's 20% or more mm -hmm. of people who are currently 30 right. who are going to die of what we would argue are metabolic diseases linked to hyperinsulinemia, yeah. right? I mean, so this is, this is a huge issue when it comes to sustainable development. Yeah, you know, that that you're not having people live, and at the same time, I've heard that that stunting in sub-Saharan Africa could be 11 percent of GDP drag on development. Mm. Yeah. So um, all of this is why I say, you know, that that humanity's existential crisis is a lack of animal source food in their diet. Yeah. I, for I, I, which, yeah, we have evidence of that. Yeah. It's not model projection. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, would, I would totally agree with that as well. You know, you look at the burden of, of disease throughout the world, just heart disease, diabetes, uh, you know, getting into cancer, autoimmune diseases. Um, 
you know, th this is, this is a huge burden uh, on, on people's health. Obviously this, the, the people are sick for decades and decades. They died decades early and this costs trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars uh, to treat this. I think it was um, Dr. Lustig said that um, we spend $2.4 trillion a year just treating the effects of uh, fructose consumption, sugar consumption, you know, with the diabetics and the heart disease and so forth. Um, that, uh, you know, 9% of Americans are diabetic and they account for 75% of the Medicare costs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and when you figure that that 40% of Americans are pre-diabetic, ostensibly, if they don't change their ways, and, and likelihood is that a lot of them won't, that in a decade or so, you'll have 50% of, of Americans uh, you know, diabetic or close to it. And what's, what is that going to do to the healthcare costs, which is, you know, a very big issue. You know, we can, we can talk about which, you know, econ, you know, economic structure is best to fund a, a healthcare system. I certainly have my own opinions, but, you know, it comes down to the fact that if you are, if you have trillions and trillions of, of dollars in excess costs, you're, you're going to bog down any system. And wouldn't those resources be far better used somewhere else. I mean, can you imagine another $2 trillion, you know, pumped into, you know, some other aspect of the economy? I mean, we'd have flying cars and, you know, be on the moon by now. <laughs> yeah. Know? And I'm disappointed we don't have those. Yeah, um, me too. Like, what yeah. was it? Like, Back to the Future too. It was we like were, we were promised. Yeah. We were, <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah. Going faster in the wrong direction is never the right idea. No. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and that seems to be all people can suggest to us. And as bad as it is in high income countries, mm -hmm. we need to get people to recognize that this is not the plagues of prosperity. This is right. not the, you know, d Western diseases, whatever, you know, that globally more people are killed by chronic disease every year than infectious. Yeah. Right. That that the majority of chronic disease deaths occur in low and middle income countries. Yeah. Now that's partly a function of population, right? Mm -hmm. But again, this is the reality. And you know, every 30 seconds someone in the world loses a lower limb due to diabetes. Wow. Oh. Now imagine that happening in a low income country. Yeah. Yeah. Versus, you know, so uh, all of that, the as bad as the burden is in high income countries. Now, mm. let's imagine what it is in these other parts of the world. And to take it back to the environmental, quote unquote, writ large, myopically viewed. The emissions intensity for beef in the United States is somewhere around 12 kilogram CO2 equivalent per kilogram boneless beef, mm -hmm. 12 to one. In Zimbabwe, it's 70. Okay. Okay. Um, something like 20% of the world's cattle live in sub-Saharan Africa. And yet they haven't really been commercialized for any number of reasons, right? Lots of cultural, lots of stuff, but it's just the landscape, right? So, or take another example, I think Brazil has like three times the number of cattle that we do in the US, but they produce less beef. Oh, okay. So yeah. increasing productivity and efficiency, there's a lot of people that just kind of twitch real hard when you talk about productivity or efficiency. But those produce environmental benefits, right. less land, less water, less feed, less emissions. Yeah. Yeah. And and so I'm not saying that we pick up what we do in the United States and we plunk it down in Zimbabwe and say there problem sorted next. Right. Yeah. We, but there are examples of um, people from uh, Livestock Innovation Lab at University of Florida, part of Feed the Future, working with Ilri out of Kenya, that they developed just basic dry cow treatment. So from during the cow's lactation cycle, mm -hmm. when she's not giving milk, there are certain things that you do to, okay. So in Nepal, they're buffalo. 
not cows. Yeah. Okay. So they just developed this, delivered it, and they saw the mastitis rate go from like 70% to like 15%. Wow. Which that's animal welfare. That's environmental because now you don't have to have as many animals, you know, rolling over. That's greater profit for the for the 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 dairyman. That's better dairy quality, food safety issues, right? All of yeah. those things. This is stuff we know how to do. Yeah. We just have to have people with the vision. So way back at the beginning of all this, you said people say we can't. Yeah. Right. There's one statement that is universally true every time it's said, everywhere it's said, it mm. won't work here. Yeah. Well, if you've got anything to do with it, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let me go talk to your neighbor who's already doing it. <laughs> yeah. Know, it's yeah. Like, um, so one of the reasons people think it we can't do it is because that's what they've been told and that's what they believe. Yeah. So one of the documents that really influenced the whole dietary guidelines was by a man named Paul Ehrlich. Have you heard of him? Uh, Population bomb? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. This dude's still around and people still listen to him. He was wrong when his dang book was published. <laughs> okay. He's still uh, wrong. It just, it just, he's still wrong. That yeah. ain't changed. He said in the book that India had lost the race to feed its population. Right. And that the that we should not give them food aid. Oh, that's nice. Right. Unless they implemented some stringent population growth initiatives, which got really dark. Right. Mm. I mean, it, it not good stuff like yeah. like uninformed sterilization of women okay yeah oh, nice. and yeah. funny thing is which cast of women that happened to versus others but but i digest let me get back to the point he's his book was published in 68. Mm. okay i remember that but okay india commissioned a stamp in 1968 commemorating the wheat revolution that was underway and by 1972 they were exporting cereals they right. had gone beyond self-sufficiency yeah to exporting yeah now that's a big discrepancy there yeah yeah <laughs> Okay, and it had consequences in human lives. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if your worldview is informed by that one, then you see things in a certain way. Meanwhile, there are people doing the hard work <laughs> that says, no, here's what's possible. We just achieved it. What's next? Yeah. And, and as long as people are thinking it's merely calories, it's merely protein, right? Then yeah. you'll have people looking for solutions down one way. And back to the point about the, the one egg a day making a significant, a lot of those people, those good researchers doing that work to improve human lives still are influenced by the conventional wisdom that there's there's such a thing as too much, like they're demonstrating the reality of too little, but yeah. they still believe that there's any reality to something called too much for mm -hmm. human health and nutrition issues, mm -hmm. right? We can deal with the environmental issue later. I need people to understand that maybe even we haven't fully explored the too little yet. Mm -hmm. Right. Maybe some of the and, and one of the people that I've leveraged from um, talks about metabolic illness as being a subclinical quasi or core. Mm -hmm. That that a, a deficit in some essential amino acids manifesting itself in some of what we're seeing in metabolic illness. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm just a forage agronomist and a ruminant nutritionist. I find it interesting. And of course, I 
I do. That's my, you know, filter and lenses and everything else. But okay, I, I, I do relate the story of giving a presentation. That same person that talked about subclinical quashiorcor, he related 10 different studies where they looked at feeding swine sufficient and deficient lysine diets. Mm -hmm. And they noticed across those 10 significantly greater subcutaneous fat, mm -hmm. significantly greater intramuscular fat, mm -hmm. marbling, and significantly smaller loin eye back muscle. Right. Okay. The next day I had a surgeon come to me in the morning before the whole thing kicked off and said, when you showed those slides, cause I had done that with some pork board, you know, loin eye marbling score. And mm -hmm. he said, I looked at my partner. I said, that's what I'm seeing in our patients. Yeah. That, and then he explained to me that there's a correlation between intramuscular fat in the back muscles and chronic back pain. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and now he's serving a low socioeconomic population in St. Louis. Okay. Who's probably eating a lot of processed cereal products in one form or another. We just explained that there can be virtually in some of them, essentially none of the lysine is, is utilizable. Yeah. Okay. What if it's lysine was this comment? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm just a forage agronomist. So here, take the information and go find some studies and see what you can do. I mean, what he said was he was introducing sixty thousand dollar devices to control back, you know, chronic pain that weren't yeah. working. Yeah. No, they don't weren't working. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's like, uh, what what is lysine supplementation cost? Oh, let's skip the supplementation. Yeah. Let's let's get them the you know let me let me connect you to the missouri cattlemen let me see what we can do about getting you know ground beef from missouri cattle into mm -hmm. st louis to your patients yeah you know maybe there's a way to make this system work a little better yeah and uh, and just to, to sort of reiterate what you were saying about lysine um you're saying that, that that's sort of a bottleneck. Whereas if you're not getting enough, if you, if you get sort of X amount of lysine, you're, you're really only utilizing and absorbing um, other proteins to that level as well. And so that, that can be like a bottleneck. So if you don't have enough lysine, you won't be able to utilize the other, other proteins uh, that you're using. And so even if you have all the other proteins in abundance, if you only have a small amount of lysine, you, you can't utilize them. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And and back to the swine industry, they've known about this uh, for a couple reasons. One is economics, right? That that if right. they don't have the right balance, then the animals aren't as profitable as yeah. um, when they are in balance. The other thing is because if you're feeding excess amounts of amino acids, but the utilization is limited, you're going to be excreting more nitrogen. Yeah. Well, that's an environmental problem. Yeah. So now you're getting the ding on, you know, not good feed efficiency, not good animal performance. So you're not making on that. And then you have the caught. Well, now back to what we talked about with the phosphorus or with the big, you know, we're shipping nutrients into concentrated feeding operations for human beings. We call them cities. Mm -hmm. And then the nutrients that aren't utilized mm -hmm. have to be managed somehow. Yeah. Well, maybe if we lowered the loading of that system by feeding more digestible forms of food, maybe that would be a good thing or at least accounted for in the system. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because you know, all these things are going to go out as, as waste. So you just, you know, you may be taking in a lot of protein. And this is, this is again, uh, where people can, can sort of fool themselves into thinking that they're so healthy and, you know, especially, you know, people that are interested in, you know, health and athletics and so forth. They're saying, look at all this protein that I'm getting. I'm getting the same amount of protein as someone who's eating meat, but it may not be absorbable or digestible, or utilizable. Uh, it's not, it may not be bioavailable. And if you're not having enough you know, lysine and so forth, you may not even be able to use it at all. And so 
Uh, and, and as you say, you know, when you're, you're toasting bread or, or cooking these sorts of carbohydrates that, that binds that lysine, um, uh, you know, irreversibly to carbohydrates. And now you, you cannot utilize that at all. So even if you think, oh yeah, I've got enough lysine, do you really, is it actually being, is it actually yeah. being accessible? And so and there's another point here that it took me far too long to realize it. Um, when we're dealing with dairy operations or well, primarily dairy, but also beef, we really emphasize to people, um, you know, you need to be testing every lot of hay mm -hmm. that you purchase or put up yourself because the feed quality varies from variety to variety, cut to cut, field to field, year to year. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that that degree of variation can have a significant impact on ration formulation, profitability, um, milk production. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure they don't print a new label for every batch that they run through the plant when a new batch of soybeans or wheat or whatever comes in. Mm -hmm. And yes, they vary. They vary tremendously. Yeah. So, so now you, you have that as a confounder to the, to the, you know, you, you don't know what it is you have yeah. now there's tolerance is supposed to be around the labels, but plus or minus, I mean, people spend a lot of time tracking things that I don't know how good the data is that they're tracking. Right. Yeah. If, they, if that makes sense. Um, and then we get to other parts of the world where they really don't have that many samples of these different foods. Mm -hmm. And so maybe there's only one sample in the database for this food that's then used to estimate what nutrient intake is from a lot of different areas around the world. So it's it the, part of the scandal is we've we've wasted so much so many resources time and money on this nutrition epidemiology of chronic disease narrative mm -hmm. and taken away from doing this other really important work that needs to be done still because we haven't done it yet because we've been distracted by these other narratives and and hopefully soon and very soon we can get more well as you said if we could take $2 trillion away from here and apply it toward what everyone in livestock agriculture understands. And that is herd health begins with nutrition. Yeah. <laughs> uh, mm. And we give in human side, it seems like we give lip service to that, but we mm. really don't because we're, yeah. we're, we're not dealing with evidence. We're dealing with narrative for a lot of it. Yeah. And, and I think that's the thing, you know, it, there it is a bit of an advantage as, you know, as, as maybe as, as callous as it seems that, you know, animals when used as a product, you know, you can maximize your potential with that product by feeding them the right things, by having them be as healthy as they can be so they can grow as large as they can. And, and this actually confers a benefit to, you know, the owner of these livestock and so forth. So it's in their best interest to make sure they're healthy, make sure they're getting the right nutrients and so forth. And so you actually have these scientific disciplines like you're, you, you know, that you're involved in uh, looking at, ex at you know, very, very uh, detailed examinations of what, what these animals are eating to maximize their, their health and potential. Whereas we're really not doing that with, with human health um, because, you know, we don't really use humans as, as a product except well, in the yeah, medical yeah. industry as well. Yeah, and yeah, so that yeah. so we have a, we have a, a sort of a and backwards incentive. Yeah. yeah. And, and, yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> and, and so we have a backwards sort of incentive there where it's actually, you know, companies or, or, you know, certain people would suggest that they're incentivized to keep people sick. I don't know if there's any sort of intentions to do that, but it's certainly, yeah. you know, people are getting sick and they are getting sicker and this is benefiting certain industries more than others. Yeah. I mean, what, the way I put it is we, in, in plant nutrition and animal nutrition, we can do a great deal to control for the variation, mm -hmm. right? In plants, we could have identical plants. I mean, we could clone them if we wanted to, mm -hmm. you know, we could have an identical soil in each pot and see what happens under control conditions. Animals a little bit more 
difficult, uh, but we can still get genetically similar animals to use under control conditions. There are ethics and there's reviews and there's lots of things. One of my favorite stories is that uh, uh, a professor uh, emulated a swine ration based on the NHANES data, mm -hmm. right? Which is what the average, so quote unquote, American diet is. Right. And, and they fed these swine and the attending veterinarian stopped the study early because he thought it was inhumane. Yeah, yeah, inhumane. What was happening to the swine? <laughs> um, but but so, <laughs> at one meeting, I was saying, you know, it's very hard to find large groups of genetically similar human beings that you can control completely for long periods of time, yeah. know exactly what you're feeding them and what they don't eat. Yeah. Okay, and then a good friend of mine spoke up from the audience and said, "And slaughter them at the end to determine yeah. body composition." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. It's hard to get people to sign up for that. Yeah. Um, and yet, that's essentially a production cycle. Yeah. In these, you know, Western livestock production systems, it gets more difficult when we have animals out grazing, especially when we get on the rangeland where it's far more variable and diverse. But still, it, it you know, it's not an, it's it's not a bad thing that you can't do that with human beings. Right. Yeah. That's right. That's yeah, I'm, I'm cool yeah. with not being able yeah. to do that with human beings. The problem comes in where people act as if they are, mm. right? Where they say things implying that they know with certainty right. that X will lead to Y, and there's no way that you can know that. Yeah. And I, I think people are getting very tired of hearing people make these confident assertions that they can't know. Yeah. And you know, it's like, what do we know? What, where are the holes in our information? Yeah. And let's let's be honest about it. And and I think we'll make a lot more progress if we could get to that kind of a state. Yeah, I think so, too. Um, well, Peter, thank you very much. I, I'm, I'm conscious of your of your time, um, but I really appreciate you coming on just to sort of reiterate, you know, just to touch on a few things that we talked about, um, you know, sustainability uh, is, is a much more complex model than just you know, is, is this, you know, can we, can we grow crops or, or, is, or, or animals because this plays into the whole, you know, uh, economic and medical structure of health and, and well-being as well. Um, but from also what you're saying, animals really do benefit the environment. They benefit the soil, they benefit the air, they, they utilize and recycle um, uh, nutrients. The water that they use doesn't get used up, it gets recycled out, you know, and they urinate and defecate. And this actually helps the land as well. Um, so that animals can be used as fertilizers and they benefit the land. Um, there's a very big difference between crude and usable protein. And that's after we talk about bio or before we even talk about bioavailability of the different protein um, and uh, protein sources. Um, lysine is a, is a stopgap. If you don't get enough lysine, you know, if you have, even if you have enough of the other amino acids, you're not going to be making proper proteins. And so those will go out in waste. Um, and that you know, were talking about, you know, animal emissions from the, uh, from the animal industry, this is actually comparable or even less than, than crop agriculture. And, you know, if you're going to switch to an animal or plant-based uh, style, then you're actually going to probably increase emissions. And that you know a lot of these these crops that uh, are utilized by the animals are actually waste products. They would either be thrown away or have to be burned in order to get get rid of them and make way for the new crops. And whereas an animal can eat them and recycle these nutrients and provide benefit and nutrition uh, to people as well. Um, and that you can't have plant agriculture without animal agriculture. They go hand in hand. There's symbiosis there, which makes perfect sense when you think about. The ecosystem and how you know all life evolved you know we evolved plants and animals have evolved together in a, in a balance and if you don't have that balance then you're you're going to cause some serious uh disruptions in you know the ecology uh and health of of the world um and that there's a massive massive issue with malnutrition around the world even in places that get enough calories and even are overweight you know as you say overfed and undernourished 
And that uh, is a term I heard you used, um, you know, that this isn't, you know, a Western disease or affluenza, just that, that in the uh, wealthier nations, that this is just because we have excessive, uh, you know, desires and we, and we meet those, but in fact, that all a lot, the majority of these are hitting impoverished nations that uh, have a much greater impact because as you say, you know, someone gets an amputation in a Western country, well, they've got all sorts of different supports with, you know, medical community and, you know, and uh, prosthetics and different sorts of uh, tools and, and resources to help them live uh, as normal of a life as possible. Whereas if you're in, in middle of rural India and you lose a leg, you're in a, in a much different state and, uh, and it's going to have a much greater impact on your life. Uh, and then of course the, 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 the human impact that translates into uh, a greater societal impact when you have a misdevelopment or even underdevelopment of, uh, of people nutritious you know, from a nutrition standpoint, they're not getting enough, you know, human appropriate nutrition. And so like you said, I think it was, you said it was an 11% drag on the GDP of just this underdevelopment uh, of people, you know, intellectually and physically and so forth. And so this is, this has a, a massive impact on the world. It does not cause global warming. In fact, it, it uh, is, is something that can, can help the environment greatly. And, by taking, by not you looking at this into, in the, into the large complex system that it is and being myopic and just looking at one detail, which is something that, that humans will want to do, you're, you're really missing the forest for the trees because there's so much more going on here that is very important. You have to, you have to get, you know, get past the surface and really dig deep and see exactly what the hell is going on here. Um, is that, is that a, a, a decent summary? Uh, perfect. I give you, I give you a hundred percent on the exam. You're perfect. Well. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Was it, is there anything else that you wanted to, to touch on or, um, or say? No, I just thank you again for the opportunity. Um, I encourage the listeners to explore. There's lots of information available. I try to share sources mm -hmm. and certainly feel free to contact me. I'm all over social media. Um, so I'm not hard to get in touch with. And mm -hmm. I hope someday very soon that I get to visit that fair part of the world. I've only yeah. ever been to Sydney. So I, I hear there's mm -hmm. a whole nother part to the country. Yeah, there's there's a little bit more to it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh... So I could land in Sydney and drive to Perth in a day, right? I mean, that would be okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it would be, uh, yeah, I think it's something like 40, 40, 40, 4 hours of driving uh, east to west. Yeah, yeah. So it would be like going, you know, from from east to west coast in the U.S. You know, straight across. Yeah. And uh, I've done that before. It's not fun. I went. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, it's not, it's not good. I went to Arizona to Maine, and that was just oh, that's a, a big chunk of my life. I, I will never get back. And, <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. Um, great, Peter. Well, so so what was the best place for people to find you and find your work and um, and to see see your your stuff? You can find me by name on YouTube. Mm -hmm. You can find me on Twitter at grass based one word. Also on Instagram, same mm -hmm. title. Um, there's a grass-based health page on Facebook and you can reach me at peter.ballersted at gmail.com. Fantastic. Great. Well, Dr. Ballersted, I really appreciate your time. Thank you for, for coming on. Dr. Chaffee, it's been my pleasure. Doctor. <laughs> Doctor. <laughs> Doctor. <laughs>